Hello and welcome to the summer introduction to paleontology sequence. Sorry, it's been so long since my last video. I've been busy finishing up a summer job and moving back into school, but now I'm back with our presentation on preparation and creation. So for review, from last time we talked about field work. Bones are removed from the field in plaster jackets to protect them so they don't get damaged during transport. Um, some of the smaller fossils, such as leaves, teeth, and invertebrates, can be wrapped in toilet paper or paper towels or aluminum foil and transported back in cardboard flats rather than using the heavy plaster. And when fossils are brought from the field, they're taken to a museum or to a preparation lab. So, preparation. Preparation is lab work, and in general, we spend approximately 500% more time in the lab than in the field. So what that means is, say it takes three weeks to remove a leg bone from the field. It could take a month, two months, three months to prepare that leg bone. And that's not a whole dinosaur, that's just one leg bone. So lab work takes a very, very long time. It's also a very delicate process. You have to remove all the matrix, the rock, from the fossils and expose the fine details without chipping the bone or damaging it. Um, in some cases, it's even more careful than that. For instance, in those rare cases where there's mummified dinosaur skin, where there's the scales are actually preserved in the sediment, then you have to carefully take off the sediment that isn't the scales without damaging the sediment that is. So it can be extremely delicate and very painstaking and slow because of that. We use a variety of different tools to do preparation. One of them is air scribes. Um, we saw some of the larger air scribes when we talked about field work, but we use small delicate ones in lab work. We also use dental picks and pin vices um, for some of the work that you don't want to do with an air scribe because an air scribe will move too quickly or put too much vibration and break something. You use the hand tools. We also um, will often use acetone while using the hand tools. Acetone breaks up the matrix a little bit, makes it easier to remove. And in case of breakage, we use B72, Butfar, and Paleobond, which are all different forms of super glues. Um, and if you overuse those, then the acetone can also be used to take some of the extra glue back off. So a typical lab setup, um, you often work under a microscope, especially for smaller fossils. Um, this allows you to zoom in, see the fine details, and therefore take off the rock without damaging those fine details. We often use a, a bag of sand to prop up the fossil um, to, one, support it for more delicate things like ribs or vertebrae. You want to put it on the sandbag so it conforms to the shape of the fossil so you don't have to hold it the whole time. And then it also prevents you from scratching a fossil on the table. When you use, especially an air scribe, you want to work in small lines towards the fossil, um, working back along the matrix. So you find a little spot of exposed bone and then slowly, delicately under your microscope, work toward that, gradually expanding it until you've revealed the whole fossil. And we use the glue, um, like I mentioned before, and epoxy putty to repair cracks in the fossil, especially if something is going to be casted and molded and casted later, you want to make sure all the cracks are filled in so that during that process the bone doesn't get damaged. So the picture below shows what a typical lab setup might look like. Um, in this case, she is working on a larger fossil, so no sandbag, um, but she is still using a microscope, a light source, um, I believe she's vacuuming there, but would also be using air scribes or similar tools to prepare whatever that fossil is. So once a fossil is prepared, you have to do curation and cataloging with it. So one of the big uh, one of the big points in cataloging is numbering the fossils, putting them into a database. 
So an example of a fossil number might be UCRC PV200 or DMNH14257. Catalog numbers are unique to each fossil and can be used to identify the individual specimens. So the first four letters usually refer to the institution where the fossil is stored. It won't always be four letters, just these two examples are. Um, then in the second chunk, there will either be letters saying what part of the collection it belongs to, like PV could be paleontological vertebrate, um, and then a number designating that. Or in other cases, such as the DMNH number, the, there is no prefix for the type of specimen it is, it's just given a number. And those numbers are not exclusive to only paleontological collections. In a museum, every single item within the museum will have a number like that. We also have to store fossils once they're prepared. They don't just sort of disappear into the ether to be pulled out later. So we have to store them in metal cans or racks, or in individual boxes. Usually less than 1% of a museum's specimens end up on display. Everything you see when you go to a museum, that's a tiny fraction of everything that's there. In most museums, if you see a door that you can't go through, usually it leads to more collections. Occasionally offices, but even offices sometimes are collections. So any place you can put store, store collections um, is usually utilized. Another part of paleontology, again, is reconstruction. So this is the molding and casting. Um, we also do scientific illustration. Um, so say you want to publish a description of the fossil. You may, along with photographs, want to have an illustration of it to show different details. Um, scientific illustration, as well as molding and casting, can also be used to do flesh reconstructions, whereas, say you take a, a dinosaur skeleton and then basically hypothesize, okay, what did it look like in flesh and blood? Um, scientific illustration, these are obviously two-dimensional, whereas with molding and casting you can create three-dimensional reconstructions of a dinosaur or other prehistoric creature. Um, so when we're fleshing out the bones, that's usually called paleo art. Um, after that's all completed, once the fossils are prepared and in some cases replicated, then you want to do research on them. So one of the big things we do with research is identifying and naming new species. Um, by comparing a fossil to things found previously, we can determine is this something new and different from what we've seen in the past. Um, we can also find out about the evolutionary history of the fossil. Um, some fossils have information that help us determine environmental changes through prehistory. We can sometimes figure out behaviors based on trackways or um, even how the bones were found, if they were found in conjunction with multiple specimens or on their own. There's a lot of things we can discover by research on fossils. Um, and then once you've completed your research, you have to present it to the scientific community. Paleontology is a science. so. A couple different ways to do this are posters and talks at large conferences, like the SVP conferences. Um, you can also publish peer-reviewed papers in scientific journals, such as the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology and other sister publications. And then there's multimedia, mostly used for public outreach, documentaries, such as those on National Geographic or Discovery Channel. Um, audio records, podcasts, interactive websites, um, museum media. There's lots of ways to present research both to scientific community and to the general public, and usually it's the multimedia that's used for the general public. So, exhibition. This is the part that everyone sees and knows and loves. It's a very lucky few fossils. Um, like I said before, there's about 1% of fossils that get put up on display. Usually, 
what's mounted in a museum is not the real bones. Um, usually replicas made by molding and casting are displayed. Field Museum is an exception. All, all the bones they found in Sioux are mounted with the exception of the skull because the skull's too heavy, it would have fallen and broken and that would have been a disaster. Um, but in general, up in their Evolving Planet exhibit as well, all the fossils are the real bone when they have the real bone. Mounting requires a great understanding of how modern and fossil animals lived, moved, ate, died, and were discovered. So when we find things in articulation, it's really easy to figure out, okay, here's at least more or less how all the bones fit together. But when we do find things in articulation, they're often steamrolled flat. They're not preserved in three dimensions. So occasionally we'll find three-dimensional fossils, but they're extremely rare. So we look at modern animals to figure out, okay, if you have a animal with upright hips um, that's bipedal, but has a long tail and a long torso, how could that have moved? How fast could it have run? Things like that. Um, so we have to do a lot of comparative anatomy to figure out exactly how prehistoric creatures would have looked in life. Um, an exhibition is really the accumulation of all the steps before. You can't put something on display until everything else is done on it. So here's some examples of some of my favorite exhibits through what I've seen um, at a variety of different museums. Obviously there's Sue from the Field Museum, um, a mammoth from the mammoth site in South Dakota, um, some beautifully prepared crinoids um, in the bottom left corner from the Wyoming Dinosaur Center, and then a really exquisite mount of two dinosaurs rolling on top of each other. Actually, in that case, it's sort of funny. They're actually the same specimen, just molded and casted to create two individuals and put into a possible lifelike pose. So for further information, um, I have a couple links for you guys, again, as usual. Um, I'll put them in the information section below. Um, I encourage you to go browse them. They have more great information if you're interested on the techniques for preparation, from research, for mounting, all of that good stuff. So next time we're going to step back and take a look at geologic time and learn how scientists classify all of Earth history and how we know how to break up the time periods. If you have questions, feel free to email me or post them in the comments below, and I look forward to seeing you guys next time.